Welcome to And Then Everything Changed, a podcast about the pivotal moments in life and decisions that define us. I'm your host, Ronit Plank. Today, my guest is Stephanie Bonastia. Stephanie is a diet culture recovery coach specializing in helping women overcome food and body image issues. She struggled with multiple eating disorders for over 25 years and experienced her own recovery with the help of a coach and lots of self-exploration. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm very happy that you're here. And I know we have much to cover, so I'd love to dive in. And I'm very curious about going back in time a little bit. And because you had an eating disorder for so many years, if you can recall what you were like before the eating disorder took hold. Yeah, um, great question. I, I was about 15 years old, I would say, when the first signs of my eating disorder kind of made their appearance. And prior to that, I, wa- I am the oldest of three. So I was a pretty mm. typical oldest child. I was, um, you know, straight A student kind of thing, perfectionist, conscientious, responsible. But mm. also I was um, soft-spoken and insecure. I was a shy child for the most part. I had close friends, but I was really intimidated in front of others. I had that sort of built into me, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And I was also really a bit on the like more, um, I had a lot of emotions, a lot of big emotions and a lot Mm -hmm. of big like thoughts. So I remember being a kid and just really just like being into books and being into like music. And I had a creative side that was um, a little bit different from the rest of my family. So Mm. in that, in that way, I felt different. Um, Would you say that you were, would you fall into that whole sensitive empath mm, type of profile? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Although I never, I mean, I'm only recently come to think of it like that, but Mm -hmm. yes, I do think that's what was going on. And and my, nobody else in my family was like that at all. Mm. Um, And so I think I just perceived that I was different. And I also felt like that was not a good thing. Mm. Um, Did you ever get any um, explicit messages about, you know, don't cry or toughen up or (laughs) you did? I did. Um, And also that my creative side wouldn't amount to much, that it that it wasn't going to take me very far. Um, Mm -hmm. It was sort of like, okay, as a hobby, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I needed to sort of be more like my father was like entrepreneur man, you know, and Mm -hmm. and that was sort of like that go getter mentality was more the way. Mm -hmm. So um, I just sort of felt like, okay. Um, that's was the there, way. were there other women in your family or other mm. daughters in your family? Yeah. So my, I mean, my mother was obviously, and then my, I have a sister, so she was mm-hmm. two years younger than me and she was, she, to this day is, is very feisty, very, mm-hmm. um, driven person and always was. And she was sort of, to me was like, oh, she's what I should, she's what I su- I'm supposed to be like, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in certain ways. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I think that there was just a, a an overt and also a passive sort of sense of, um, you know, like I'm just a little bit, I I mean, I was called sort of names like, you know, I was too flighty and I was too, um, out there and, and things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, I was book smart, but I was repeatedly told that I was not, um, like street savvy. So Mm -hmm. that was sort of the impression of myself that I had. And, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, so then when you get into, were you a freshman or a sophomore at Mm. this point? Yeah, I was a sophomore. Yeah, and so did were things kind of stable or were things sort of uh, becoming harder for you before mm. the emergence of this, before you became aware of something had changed? I think that it was, um, well, it's like that time of your life where you're, you're becoming, I mean, you're becoming like a teenager, it's that, that pivotal mm. adolescent period. And I had, things in my family life were relatively stable, relatively. Um, mm-hmm. It was a bit of a volatile home, um, but nothing had changed. Nothing was, was wrong necessarily on the outside, but I I think I was just beginning to notice I was having friends that were sort of getting boyfriends at this time. And, Mm -hmm. um, I was, again, I was shy and I was, I was more self-conscious and I, and I was more withdrawn. And so I, um, I, I perceived this going on around me and I think I just felt lonely, even more lonely, Mm -hmm. I guess, than I had in my family. So, so that Mm -hmm. sort of was the catalyst in, for what started me, um, sort of retreating back even further into myself and starting to control something that felt like, wow, I have a lot of power here. 
Yeah, and it's it's always very fascinating to me, and I don't know a lot about disordered eating and body dysmorphia, but it's interesting to me why that I think it's like a button right mm-hmm. that gets that gets pushed in some and not in others that yeah. that this anxiety or depression or worry about control manifests this way um when you see when you know who you are now you know and you have all this history behind you does it make sense to you that it became centered in this way yeah it does and I couldn't have seen that at all until very recently actually um mm-hmm. it was the first time that I felt like I had um First of all, it, it felt like my way of speaking, and I don't think I had any uh, like idea how to speak up for myself at that time. Mm-hmm. It just it just didn't seem like something I could do. So this was a way that I could speak, I could communicate um, that something maybe was wrong, and also that I yeah had this I could control a lot more than I thought that I ever could, and it was like my little secret and. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was a power element there that I had never experienced. I had never known what it was like to feel confident or powerful. So this mm-hmm. was a great like foray into that, mm-hmm. that at the time I never would have put together. But well, yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's really, I haven't thought about that before. I mean, I knew that it was about control for a lot of people, but I hadn't thought about the power part that yeah. with control comes power, right? Like yeah. this is a way of basically deciding for yourself something that only you can decide about. Yes, and there was an anger behind it too, and I, and I think that it was an anger, you know, at having felt like I was, um, like my part of my personality had sort of been suppressed, and mm-hmm. this was um, a taking back of that in a way. And I think, and I wouldn't, it would never have occurred to me to be angry, but mm-hmm. um, now I understand my, my entire eating disorder was a lot of anger. There was a lot of anger behind it, and so it was mm-hmm. a way to express that in a in a like in, more indirect sort of. Yeah, and it's it sounds like, you know, I wonder if there's a correlation, and I feel like there might be between that type of personality that is a little shyer mm-hmm. or a little less likely to be feisty like your sister and turning inward on the, on oneself rather than, mm-hmm. it, you know, exhibiting the anger for other people and lashing out. Absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, I think that some people are just, I mean, we're just wired differently. Yeah. And, and I turned in everything. And to this day, I mean, I do, I still turn in all the time to introspect and, and, and think, and, and that's just how I am. And I think it was just the easiest path for me to do that. And it was, it was, it was very natural progression to me mm. to just turn this. And also I think that I felt like myself was, there were parts of me that were acceptable and there were parts of me that were not. And, um, this was a way of like, just sort of, hushing one side of me and and bringing out my other side and I think that is sort of an internal there is an internal rejection there Mm -hmm. and I think that that you know turning on oneself is part of turning you know is, is part of a part of that yeah and when things started to progress for you um did you did you do okay in school did your friends did your relationships at home and in in with friends change at all um I did oh I, I I managed to keep my head above water in school, um, but my friendships started to change. My friends noticed that I was you know I wasn't I wasn't coming out as much because I was mm-hmm. actually more concerned about the calories I would be consuming or the exercise I wouldn't get to do. So mm-hmm. I would you know I would not go out. And yes, my friends actually were very supportive of me there during that time, and they reached out when they saw that I was withdrawing, and they tried mm-hmm. to pull me in. And I was open about what was going on. Actually, they did mm-hmm. know. Um, but I, uh, I couldn't be swayed. It was, it was, I was deep at that point and I, um, I didn't really want out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I do hear from what I've learned that it's so, I don't even think insidious really captures it. I feel like once these, uh, eating disorders take hold, they're really hard to take, you know, to pull out, like you just can't get to the roots. Yeah. I think I had a lot of unexplored territory there and I, um, I wasn't ready. I, I don't think I had communicated what I needed to communicate. It hadn't happened yet. I hadn't mm-hmm. like made my stance, you know, it was sort of this misguided attempt at saying, you know, something's wrong. Yeah. Um, so I never really got to the root of it. And did you have any, um, and of course I, I should clarify that I mean the people who love you to get to the root of it, right? Like I, I, I think of it as like a mom to a kid Mm. because, you know, when you're in it, you know, it's really hard to excise it. And so once it takes root from my understanding and talking to other guests and even friends who've experienced this, it's really difficult to help someone out of it. 
Yeah. And my parents' main concern at the time, I mean, they saw, I, I, I had started out um, with anorexia and I had gotten very small and my frame was just very delicate and, and um, I, I looked sick, you know, when I look back. Mm. My parents noticed this and my mom was upset and, and um, but th their main goal was to get me to gain weight. So this is a lot of times what happens is th mm. that the idea becomes, okay, well, we have to get you better by getting you to eat. Mm. So she intervened to that end. And in fact, my, what my parents ended up doing was telling me that I couldn't play my high school sport um, anymore if I didn't gain weight, which makes sense. I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of physical health. Um, but it just, what it did was it, it, I became desperate because I, I wanted to um, play and I, I played field hockey and I um, started to eat um, actually. And I literally remember the moment that I opened the fridge and I realized I, I, I need to do this or I'm, or, you know, it was like this, this decision I had to make. Mm -hmm. And I opened the fridge and my mom had made this pasta salad, which I, I mean, I wasn't eating anything close to pasta salad for, for mm -hmm. years. And I binged on the entire pasta salad. And that began like my next eating disorder, which was, um, I became bulimic at this point, but mm -hmm. I did it not, I did not purge. I wasn't able to do that for uh, my mm -hmm. body just wasn't letting me do that. So I would exercise purge or I would mm -hmm. restrict purge. So I was vacillating between like literally eating nothing on, on one day and binging, you know, the whole through the mm -hmm. kitchen the next. And I lived mm -hmm. like that for the next a uh, lot of years and um and nobody could tell that one like no. that was harder to see it was so much harder to see and everyone was just happy because mm -hmm. i gained the weight back mm -hmm. and i would say to my parents and especially my mom i am i am not well i am i am really like i am struggling i went to college like that mm -hmm. and i checked myself out of college my sophomore year because i couldn't do it anymore and no one sort of I, again I, I felt minimized in terms mm -hmm. of saying i need help i need help Mm -hmm. And everyone's saying, you're, you're okay. You just, you got us to stop being so obsessed with food. But I looked like normal on the outside. I was restored weight wise. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it wasn't taken seriously. So I took it upon myself to, um, check myself out of school. I stopped, you know, the tuition payments, um, because at that point I was over 18 and, mm -hmm. um, I, I showed up at my parents' door, um, uh, my sophomore year and said, I am, I was serious. I really need help. Mm. And what happened? How do they respond? <laughs> At first, they were angry um, that I had done that. You know, it was sort of like, what? We're paying all this tuition <laughs> and you're what? Mm -hmm. Like, who? Well, my, you know, my father would, didn't take it well. Mm -hmm. My mother um, said, well, okay, I guess this is where we are. And she did. Um, she got me into therapy and she um, got me into um, a, uh, an uh, outpatient program that mm -hmm. I then spent the next couple of semesters in and out of. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first official treatment. Mm -hmm. How was your, you know, what were the times like, you know, overall when you think about this period of time when you're in and out of treatment and, you know, your parents kind of know, okay, there is something wrong. You know, she wasn't okay. You've made this plea for help and you're getting it. What was your, I mean, I don't know, getting it is in quotes because I don't mm -hmm. know how sympathetic everything was there for you. But what was your, when you think back on this time, what would you say the, the impression is of how you were living? I was one of them it was one of the most miserable periods of my life i i felt mm -hmm. well for well because the treatment didn't help me per se i mean mm -hmm. it, it started getting me thinking it started you know it was like it was the first time i've been in therapy so i was like being yeah. asked questions and, and looking at myself in a whole new way but it wasn't affecting my behaviors my my, my symptoms stayed as strong as they ever were and mm -hmm. so to me it was sort of like well oh my gosh now i'm in treatment and i'm not getting better Mm -hmm. that's scarier because mm -hmm. it's like, well, if this isn't going to help me, what is? So to me, it was a very dark time. And I was now out of college. I just felt like, oh my gosh, what have I done to my life? Mm -hmm. And where is it going? I can't even see a path for me anymore. Who have I become? Mm -hmm. I don't know myself. I don't like it. And I don't see any way this isn't getting better. So yeah. it was dark for all of us, actually. My family was... Um, would would say the same if you were to ask them to did you think about ending your life during this time no i never was suicidal i was very depressed um mm -hmm. very very depressed but i always had hope mm -hmm. it was, it, i don't i don't know why but that's mm -hmm. it was something i never considered 
Well, that's also, I mean, and I know even less about that, but it seems to me like it's, it's so individual what gets triggered and what happens for someone on their mental health mm-hmm. journey. Um, but it sounds like, is it accurate to say that you didn't like yourself? Yes, <laughs> very accurate. Yeah, yeah. And, and did you have anyone close to you besides your family? Did you have really good friends or a boyfriend or anyone who was like who you mm. could trust and really lean on? I did have really good friends. I did not have mm-hmm. a boyfriend. I wouldn't w- let anyone near me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did have really good friends from high school who I am still remain best friends with today. Oh, who, wow. Yeah. And in college. I mean, my college friends actually ended up being extremely supportive. And I'm also really good friends with them today. Um, mm-hmm. And everyone cared. I had a lot of support. And I, I did confide in um, my best friends. And I, I was very open about it. At that point, I wasn't secretive anymore. And I just was very, um, and, and I, I accepted their support, but I just, it, when you're in this place, there's like a barrier you wear and there's only so much that can get in. And, um, I think for all of that support that I had, it just, and the treatment I had, it just, there was something around me that I, I couldn't let any of it really get in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then this, did this continue for a while? Cause I know that you're, and the only reason I know this is cause you're, you mentioned in your, in your bio that your eating disorder was about 25 years long, one or more. Yeah. It was just as almost 25 years. I, yeah. um, yeah. So that was in college, you know, up to the point of taking you at this point, but, and it, it ebbed and flowed, I would say, um, for for, for various reasons, it would it would rise and fall over the next, I guess, what, almost 20 years. I did even get married. I had three kids. But the mm. entire time, there were just various um, manifestations of it. It always remained. Binge eating was, was something I strongly identified with. Bulimia would come in and out of it. And eventually, it turned into orthorexia, which um, was the obsession with clean eating and wellness. And um, binging the whole way through, through my pregnancies, all of it, it it, I got so much help and I did so much work to figure myself out through therapy and self-help books and treatment centers and and I couldn't and it, I just thought it was my lot. I figured it was just the mm. way my brain was wired and that I had a broken um, hunger and fullness. Mm. Yeah. Well, it would be easy to think that too because it happened, it started so early for you, right? Yeah. And, and there is that, there is, can you talk a little bit about that because I know this is your background, about the hunger and fullness signal? Mm. Yeah. So because it, it did develop when I was 15, I, I, I had at this point chalked it up to hormones. I figured, well, something shifted when, when, I, when I went you know, became when my, my hormonal cycle had started, that must have just triggered something that made my hunger, um, extremely forceful and my fullness blunted. And Mm. so I believed that wholeheartedly. And I went to actually multiple like endocrine doctors and, you know, hormone specialists to try to, to try to cure me. What I know now is that the pattern that I was in that had started so young of restriction and binging, um, is that binging is not of it, of it in and of itself binging is not the disorder it's the restriction so all of the restricting I was doing between binges was setting mm-hmm. myself up for the next binge mm-hmm. so um, right 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 that yeah so so when your body goes into restriction even if it's not even calorically that significant any anything under where your body wants to hang out in terms of calories will be perceived as semi-starvation and, and we're evolved to um understand this as a famine so your body will then go to great lengths to increase your hunger signals and to slow your metabolism down so that you make sure that you get food in case the next famine is around the corner and that's the way that this was working all of these years and I was inadvertently Mm -hmm. thinking that I was being good quote unquote by following up a binge by not eating so much and the whole and binge um, recovery, like binge treatment, was geared towards sl- stopping the binges, minimizing the binges, which which shows up as restriction. I mean, really, that's what mm. happens. Mm-hmm. And it just makes it, it just it just sounds right like up. this tangle that I, I don't even know how people untangle it. Well, I didn't either. <laughs> oh, it uh, just seems like, and it's also the thing about it. It's like you know, I mean, would you call this addic- addictive behavior too, or is that a totally separate thing? I thought, no, it is not addiction, although it feels like addiction and it looks Mm -hmm. like addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, it is addiction in terms of the, like you, the, the need to follow up a binge with restriction is almost addictive, like, because you can't fathom, like letting the food sit inside of you. It's in that way. Yes. But it's not actually a food addiction. It's actually very much a 
biologically wired um, evolutionary response. So it's normal. Right, right. Yeah. That That's like the body trying to be healthy and yes. figure things out. But it's kind of really a difficult situation to be in because we obviously need food. I just, you know, with a lot of other areas, you might, you might be able to justify removing them or trying to create a new relationship but with food it's so hard I mean yeah. it's happening around you all the time and then you've got the culture talking to you all the time you've got media it's just like I don't know how anyone finds their way out <laughs> I didn't either and honestly I don't think that traditional treatment approaches in general and at least for me they don't either I, I think that it's it's not something because of diet culture and because of the messaging we have that you know eating less is better. Um, it's, it's only sort of perpetuating this. So the way that I ended up recovering was to take a completely radical approach that I just happened to come across that I, you know, that, that, that ended up breaking the cycle for me. And I am, I mean, I will be forever grateful that this actually came my way and just sort of like landed in my lap almost, hmm. um, because it's not oh, the way that traditional treatment is happening out there. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I actually, at, 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 in my later 30s, after I had started having kids, became really obsessed with health and wellness for them. And then it extended to me. It was such a, it just fell right into my, my obsess, obsessive sort of tendencies. And so I was a wellness coach. I was actually a sugar detox coach. I was very much in diet culture um, as I was binging and purging. So are you saying this was sort of like the orthorexia this was, was yes. like, right, right, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And um, I had came, I had come across an article in the New York Times. I forget who wrote it now, but it was, it's called Smash the Wellness Industry. And it was all about <laughs> how the wellness industry is just the diet industry in disguise. And it's become more trendy now to like, you know, superfoods and making yourself as absolutely healthy as possible, you know, in, in quotes, thin as possible. And, and I was part of the wellness industry and I really had was, I believed I was in it for health. And mm -hmm. so I read this article and I was like, no, no, I can't, I can't hear this. This is not like, what are you talking about? Wellness is like my ticket out. If I could just be well enough, I could probably maybe cure myself like out of this binging if I just heal my gut enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I read this article and it, it stayed in my mind for like two years. Hmm. And I guess I was following someone on Instagram who brought it up again. And I, paid attention and they said something about this book called The Fuck It Diet by Caroline Dooner and I <laughs> was like what is that you know and I sort of researched that book and it um it had just come out like just and I I got the book I don't know why I decided I got the book and um it was like my life it was like reading my life story um and basically the idea being that to cure your binge eating you don't have to eat less, you have to eat more and that you have to stop restricting between the binges and just continue eating, allowing all food and releasing all the guilt around food mm -hmm. and all of this effort to temper your binges. You just sort of have to accept them and allow them and eat. Mm. And it was like the most terrifying <laughs> yeah, thing I that I could imagine doing. But I, yeah. on my birthday, I said, I'm, I'm starting this and I did. And I struggled for about three months, maybe a little more, with just eating the world. I mean, I just was like, I'm just never, this is just not going to stop. And I, <laughs> I, I really was like, I don't know what I'm doing. But I didn't know, I, at, that, at this point, it was 25 years later, and I was like, well, nothing else has worked. And lo and behold, by you know Christmas of that next year, I, I realized that I was no longer binging, and I was no longer feeling like I was out of control around food. Hmm. And that began the whole thing. And it I have not binged or restricted or purged since. Um, and how, how long ago is that? Two years. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, I mean, when I tell you that I wake, I still wake up. You know, it used to be I would wake up and I would be like, oh, God, what did I do yesterday? How much did I eat? Oh, gosh, how much can I eat today? What can I not eat today? How am I going to get through the day with all the all this hunger? And mm -hmm. now I wake up and it's just not there. That mm -hmm. that is that it's like gone to me is like I, I'm so grateful for that. And I'm still in awe. I'm still like, wow, I cannot <laughs> believe that this worked and I wasn't broken all that time. I mean, it, it's just like an unbelievable feeling to break free. Um, yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, it does not go by, a, a, not a day goes by that I don't really feel really grateful for that. 
Yes, because it's really a matter of chance. It could have been yeah. something you didn't see or that you didn't decide to try. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I meet people now, I coach people who, you know, when I, well, when we talk about, you know, the, the strategies to stop binging, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> what? Like, who, who does this? Um, mm-hmm. But it is, I mean, I have coached women out of binging myself now. So I have watched it happen to other people. And there's a whole community out there of, of so people then- who are doing this. How does it work? So I'm curious because there's obviously this physiological thing that you've corrected and that you're always strengthening, I guess, by by being healthy. Like it's like this, maybe it's like a loop. Like you, you take good care of yourself. You don't fall into the old pattern and then you just get stronger in the new pattern. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that pretty accurate with the food cycle right now? Like you're just always affirming it? Yeah, it builds on itself. And also mm-hmm. I, I feel like I, I have so much awareness around my, like what would be a slippery slope. So any, any time that I, I would begin to feel anything like my old mentality coming back in, I mean, now this is not so much an issue, but in the beginning it was, I know it and I see it mm-hmm. and I catch it and I revert. I go, you know, I, I literally had to change the way that my brain thinks and, and hmm. all of its um, instincts, all of the instincts to restrict or to, you know, or to judge. And that took, oh, uh, like year, a year at least of rewiring my brain. And so now it's, it's something that I, I, I do second nature now, but in times of stress actually, um, mm-hmm. or when I'm sick or something, it, I will hear that same message, the that old brain pattern coming in and trying mm-hmm. to like lure me, but it's, mm-hmm. it's like, this isn't happening. I mean, I'm, it's most certainly not happening, but it's just interesting that I will still hear yeah. the message. Um, which I openly and like just reject, but I, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, I doubt it will ever f- fully go away. Cause I think it was wired there as like a sure. teenager and your brain is forming. But, well, you yeah. know, the other thing is about this and I'm wondering, so you've got the physi- the physical part of it. And of course the, the constant need to be on top of it, you know, mentally and emotionally, what is it like now for you to to get the media images the 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 mm. messages that are kind of orthorexic the you know this whole culture we're in here in the US and probably other places how do you contend with that part of it when mm. when people around you are talking about their bodies or they're disparaging body size like how do you how yeah. do you stay healthy and strong then it's really difficult and in the beginning i would get really angry and i would try to convince everyone you know, that this was not the way and it was tiring. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And actually you're not going, I'm not going to do that because Mm -hmm. there's a whole world, you know, so I I do understand at this point now. And when I hear this going on, I have turned it into like that spam messaging in my mental (laughs) inbox. Like it's really just not something I have. I don't have the amount of energy to pay attention to it. Um, But when people seem like they're on the cusp of like, wow, I've just been dieting for so long or I've been had an eating disorder for so long and I can't get out, you know, when, when they almost seem like, are you ready to hear it? Then that's like something I can engage in a conversation. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I really just have, I've learned to tune it out and to Mm -hmm. um, invest in the community of people that I have found through my work, both my clients and just people who follow me and also colleagues I I now have in this space who, Mm -hmm. and I sort of like just joining hands with them and, and understanding that yes, the world is not, does not operate under this assumption, but we do and it has saved our life and so there's a lot of camaraderie and strength to be found there yes and and i, I there's a question i have about your husband how long have you been married <laughs> um yeah we got 2008 so um 12 years yeah. yeah so how concerned was he and has he been re- aware of the change like how has it been for him yeah he's an extremely supportive person and i'm not sure i could have done it without him i think i cried to him daily for like mm. a year as i was going mm-hmm. through this Um, he was concerned about my, um, initial, like my eating disorder behaviors in the earlier parts of our marriage, like when I would not eat for days and when I would purge when I was pregnant, like things Mm -hmm. like that, that was concerning to him. When I decided to go through this, he knew everything, by the way, he, he, uh, there was nothing I hid from him. Mm -hmm. Um, he was actually the only person I was talking to at that point because all my friends and family had assumed I was recovered and I didn't have, I didn't tell them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, So he, when this sort of came across, when I was reading the fuck it diet and I was like, I think he just saw how, uh, it it just like, it spark, it it made me come alive as I was reading this book. And I think he was like, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And he, he didn't, he never wavered. He never wavered. He was like, this is, this makes so much sense. 
I, you need to you need to just keep going. You just need yeah. to keep going. You will come out on the other side. Just keep going. I think he could see the progress I was making um, mentally before mm -hmm. it happened physically. And I think that he trusted it and thought it made a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I, I leaned on him. Now I'm a coach to provide that to people who don't have someone to lean on. But yeah. I needed to be reassured. I can't imagine being in an intimate relationship with someone and, you know, we all have struggles. Our spouses go through things. We're there for them. There's mental and physical issues. It just seems like such a, an all-encompassing experience to have a spouse who is just deeply, deeply entrenched in disordered eating. It yeah. seems like it would be so hard to really, you know, connect with them and, and try to help. That's a great point. And, and to be honest with you, I think, I mean, I, there was a measure, a, a point of like, you feel just so alone, truly in it. And as much as he was supportive, he couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, Grant, his support was everything, but yes, he couldn't understand it. And it was confusing to him. And I wasn't always present. In fact, I was never like present, especially even as we had kids. I mean, this was a mm -hmm. source of uh, shame for me in terms of not being able to like enjoy our family vacations or birthday dinners or anything. Always mm. I was calculating and, uh, I was never there. And so, um, I, I but, but I also think, uh, with a spouse, it's, you know, I'm not sure how much he realized I wasn't there in the moments. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he just sort of like, he was like, Oh, like, I don't think he would have known any different if I didn't tell him. But you're um, also really busy with kids, right? I mean, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I knew that I was like, I'm not even here right now. Like I am mm -hmm. just like, I am just in a, in another place. And he wouldn't have necessarily known that until later we, we got in bed and I'm like, Oh my gosh, today was terrible. And da, 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 you know, and then he's like, Oh, okay. Okay. But now yeah. I think now he sees that like now that I'm recovered, he's like, Oh my gosh. Like, okay. Like this yeah. is, this is you recovered. Like this, this is different. I don't mm -hmm. know that he would have necessarily been able to see it back then. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause in a way it's like he only knew variations of that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So then can you talk about how you became, you know, a coach? Like when did you start doing this work? And you know, yeah. Yeah. I was, um, I was an occupational therapist. I mean, I still have a degree in, in license in occupational therapy, but, um, when I did recover, I, again, I, there was such an amount of gratitude I had and I had been a health coach, right? So I was doing all the sugar detox coaching on the side of my, of my, you know, OT, uh, as an OT. When I recovered, I, I just knew something in me was like, I want to help people do this. I mean, I really want to help people do this. And so I took what was my side wellness business and I completely pivoted, mm -hmm. started over, started from scratch, but I kind of knew what I was doing. I knew how coaching worked. I was like, well, I'm just going to do this on the side. So I started mm -hmm. creating this coaching business on the side, but it, it grew so fast and I was so, it just lit me up so much that mm -hmm. I decided to actually make it a full-time career and I love it and I've never looked back and it's just something that I enjoy doing literally every single day. I love holding people's hands through this process and watching what mm. happens. So this is what I do now and I, I yeah, I, I, I'll never go back. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's still, it's staggering to me how recent all this is. Yeah. You know, you've built so, so much in just such a short time and I feel like once you really got a hold of this, you've just not looked back from what I can hear. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I, I it's like a, a switch does flip. I have no fear of or or I mean I just see so clearly now. It's like funny when you asked me in the beginning of this inter you know of the mm -hmm. podcast how it had started. I see so clearly now what I went through and why I went through it, and mm -hmm. I can never unsee that. And so mm -hmm. I I have no um I have no doubt in like th that this works and that this is something that I, I just can never like turn this backwards and I want to help other people see that as well. So there's mm -hmm. the passion is, is just there. And I, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what drives the business. Well, you know, right before we, in a second, I'm going to ask you to just kind of tell us where we can find you, but do you have, um, I know it's a really complex subject and I don't mean to make it small and, you know, in like a little, um, uh, tiny little tip, but I was curious if you have any, advice for people who are listening who might have concern for a child a teenager or even a grown-up friend uh you know is there something you would say watch for or something that you'd say definitely you can do right now to maybe check in that's a useful thing to do that doesn't help make it worse 
Yeah. So from the perspective of, of being a parent and watching a child, I think any um, signs usually are of um, a lot of withdrawal. I mean, that is one of the first signs. And so the, the support of a parent, I think, being there and not discounting um, the experience of the child, I think is really huge and something I was missing. I think that it was sort of like, I do believe that in some ways eating disorder is a way of communicating. So for mm -hmm. a parent to be there and present and curious and even, and not try to fix, but just try mm -hmm. to ask mm -hmm. what is going on, what is going on. Um, and I think that one of the bigger signs right now for, for kids today is that there's this, is the wellness uh, the, that wellness leads to eating, you know, there's, you can hide an eating disorder behind this wellness. Um, mm -hmm. so if, the, if you have a teenager who is suddenly really interested in like, um, eating only clean foods and is calling foods good and bad and just becomes super impassioned about that, that that's kind of a warning sign and to take, not to, not to change it or tell, tell the, you know, the child that not, that this is not the way or to, to try to talk them out of it, but to pay more attention to, what is this person, what are they trying to tell me and what do they mm -hmm. actually need that they're not getting met? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most powerful things as a parent that you could do is to be present with them um, mm -hmm. and to just keep asking without trying to fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that advice. And, you know, what if you have someone who's about your age who starts to spiral with, uh, you know, all the powders and smoothies and mm -hmm. the greens and what, what can you do if you start to get worried about someone? That's tricky because I think as an adult, um, if you're not open to, to hearing that, then you won't. And it mm -hmm. could actually cause a greater strain on the relationship. But I think it's the same. I think it's right. about being there for someone and letting them know that you're not judging anything, and, but, but that you're there if they need if they need mm -hmm. support or need someone to listen to, um, you can also try giving them the fuck it diet book for Christmas or something. Or, <laughs> or giving them, giving them your link. Um, yeah. You might want to check this out. No, yeah. um, but no, it's true. I think as you were saying that, I realized that is true because when you're really hurting, something is upsetting you. You don't really know what's happening. And someone just says to you, I'm here for you. You know, I, I feel like, you know, you might, need to hear that and I'm here for you that that alone can even just open up some type of softness in someone perhaps yeah for sure and, and I think that the other piece about it which we didn't really get into today um, which is about body image and I think that that's um, another way that this all gets transmitted and so uh, for a friend anyway and for and for a, um, a child to not compliment weight loss or mm -hmm. their healthy habits in terms of making that you know that will further build up the idea that like that's what makes them worthy is their is the way that this is affecting their weight or the way that oh wow you're so good you're so um mm. you know nutrition you know your nutrition is so good that sort of fuels it and to say more something like to, to sort of support someone by showing your appreciation for their authentic self i think that that's a really mm. powerful thing to who do who they are who yeah. they are i think people need to be seen especially um, for me and for women I work with that there's a common denominator here of not feeling like we're seen for or appreciated for for the actual for who mm -hmm. we really are and that that goes a really long way and we're in a culture that really just complements appearance a lot mm -hmm. and that that I think is a it's a goose chase so to have someone yeah. see you and like really see you is probably one of the more supportive things you could do I wonder if when you were 15 and, and things were starting to begin for you if some if your parents had you know gone that way if that would have helped you if they had said you know essentially the way you are is great and yeah. we love who you are in this family and we love what you are if that would have helped you I think about it too I think my parents did the best they can coming from where they were coming from but I think it would have altered probably the core, I mean, it's all about your self image, you know, there's a lot of self image here. And, and mm -hmm. to, to, it took me until I was almost 40 years old now to um, start to like myself and to really see mm -hmm. what my traits are as valuable. Um, mm -hmm. And that's too long, you know, that's a long time to, to wait. And so, yeah, I think that starting that earlier, <laughs> the mm -hmm. better for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Stephanie, where can, where would you like people to find you? Where are the best places for people to search you out? I am very active on Instagram. That's primarily where I hang out. Um, I am Stephanie Michelle. I do coaching in my stories every day and I post daily. I have a book club I'm running now um, on mm -hmm. Facebook and I have a website where all of my coaching packages are as well. So all of, Great. Yeah, all of that. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll have all those links in your episode show notes and on the website. And I, I really appreciate hearing your story. You've been through a lot. And I'm so grateful and happy that you're able to do this work and that you're better. Thank you. I am too. <laughs> thank you for listening to And Then Everything Changed. For more on this episode, photos, and other episodes you might like, please visit atecpodcast.com. You can connect with me and learn more about episodes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram also. Just search for my name, Ronit Plank, R-O-N-I-T-P-L-A-N-K, and you will find all the updates. If you like this podcast, please remember to subscribe and also rate and review so other people can find it. Thank you so much for listening.